instead of a golden age of political integrity and economic prosperity, the last four decades since the end of the Cold War have brought the world to a dangerous juncture. People are experiencing rising inequality and powerlessness. They're wondering about the fate of their families, their communities, and the systems that move the world today. When you add climate change into the picture, our moment in history starts to look a lot like science fiction. Cynicism, frustration, and desperation are rising in countries around the world, often as a reaction to the perceived failure of democracy and globalization. If all these problems were intimately related, if they were all part of a single transformation occurring in power centers across the world, and if there were something that people everywhere could do about it, then that would be an opportunity we could hardly afford to miss. To understand this possibility, you have to try on a change of perspective. And it all begins with corruption. Corruption affects developed and developing countries alike. Unfortunately, there is corruption everywhere. In developing countries, public enemy number one is corruption. So if there's corruption, there is no rule of law. It cripples economic development, stifles entrepreneurship, and deters investment. We're familiar with corruption today along the lines of bribery, conflicts of interest, money laundering, trading and influence, abuse of functions, embezzlement, extortion, and organized crime. As these problems grow, and as people decide whether or not to confront them today, it's important to ask what happens when corruption is allowed to spread. History teaches us that the effects of corruption can be more profound than is commonly imagined. There are a number of books on ancient Rome and, and the transition for, to, from republic to empire and the fall of the empire that focused on privatization. And what they say is democracy was privatized, that everyone had their price, that access to all the different magistrates and the levels of authority in the Roman political system became a function of ability and willingness to pay. Ancient Rome became a market. And once it became a market, civic virtue was gone, everything was commercialized, National policy was devoted more to empire rather than republic, and it was weakened such that it could fall. It became vulnerable. What happened after the Roman Empire fell? Well, we went into the Dark Ages. After decades of warnings about rising corruption, democracy seemed to have entered a period of decline. Now we're getting to a point of massive corruption again, I think, comparable to Rome. According to a Freedom House report, political rights and civil liberties have been decreasing for 13 years straight, and observers warn of rising authoritarianism, abuses against the free press, attacks on judges and the rule of law, an alarming acceptance of the idea that the ends justify the means, and the targeting of political opponents and minority groups as enemies. These changes are most popular where democracy and capitalism are derailed by corruption and people don't have the tools to fight it. As people suffer from rising powerlessness and inequality, they may fall prey to frustration and even hatred. You get nationalism and xenophobia, people are being transformed. And when people get into that position of fear and insecurity, racism and nationalism are natural instincts. Besides linking corruption to the economic and political crises fueling racism, xenophobia, and authoritarianism, experts have also found a surprising link between corruption and other big picture issues, such as climate change, the failure of international development programs, and even human rights violations. Corruption is a, is a multi-layered issue. It affects society at, at different levels. The different ways it affects society range from the institutional to the interpersonal. There were horrible statements of people that were saying, I brought my uh, wife to the hospital because I couldn't pay the bribe. She died basically on the stairs of, of, uh, of the hospital. So there is definitely an, an, an element which requires all of us to, to take action simply as concerned citizens. But obviously we need to change systems. You cannot put an um, inspector or police officer behind every person to check. That's not the kind of state we want to live in. We are concerned in corruption eroding every aspect of our social, economic, and political processes. You see in the Arab Springs, what motivated the revolutions and these transitions that we're seeing now was the public frustration with corrupt regimes. 
and that was very explicit. So I see definitely corruption as a root cause of a lot of modern day conflict, including genocide and crimes against humanity. What is very interesting about all societies that go through these kinds of atrocities is that corruption plays a role as a root cause. I hope that we have reached a tolerance saturation point for corruption and corruption scandals around the world. Part of what we're doing is trying to, to raise that awareness and that education to make people understand that corruption is part of the rot that is creating these opportunities for these not so great people to do not so great things. Society cannot function equitably and efficiently when public officials, from doctors to police, judges to politicians, enrich themselves rather than perform their duties with integrity. If we take a step back and we say, what does corruption mean? And you've got that traditional definition of the abuse of public power for private gain. Well, I think we've lost our way in relying on that definition. It's not complete. It's not deep enough. The fact that there are so many definitions and so many interpretations what all constitutes corruption, um, even the corruption of our cultural norms, for example, um, is, is, is hugely counterproductive to the actual fight against corruption as we understand it. Um, because if everything is a corruption, then it becomes very hard to fight it um, and where to start and what really to focus on. 1700s, 1800s, what corruption means in the Anglo-American tradition is capture by evil. And that has an individual level and it has a systemic level. So the individual who's become corrupt, uh, it's not just they've, that they've lost their virtue, it's also that greed, envy, self-indulgence, squandering, um, disloyalty to the public good and the public interest have replaced their virtue. Corruption tends to be something that spreads. It's almost like an infection. You create a culture of corruption within a private sector in a country or a region and it just gets worse and worse and worse because other people see that they can get an advantage by engaging in these corrupt practices instead of just doing good business. Corruption for the ancient Greeks is, a, is not just the corrosion of that person's morality and the loss of their honor. It's also the transformation of the political system. And that's why they have these great names like oligarchy, right? Uh, government by the few for the purpose of making money, plutocracy, rule by the wealthy. Corruption and these practices, they happen on a daily basis. They shouldn't be accepted as a norm. They should be uh, addressed. Many aspects of corruption, from bribery to money laundering and organized crime, are infamous for crossing national borders. At a certain point, it became clear that national laws were inadequate to manage corruption, and that even many regional treaties were too. Countries around the world saw the opportunity to collaborate, share knowledge, and build the first global legally binding framework for fighting corruption. And it's at this juncture where the UN begins to play its coordinating role. The role of the United Nations is crucial. The UN Convention Against Corruption represents the fundamental recognition that corruption is neither an acceptable cost of doing business nor a necessary evil. It is a serious crime, simply unacceptable. There were times in which countries were reluctant to, to accept the fact that they had a crime problem because that perhaps was considered as not reflecting well on the ability of the, or the success of the regime. All this was swept away, so to speak, by the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so there was, a, there was a sense of optimism, a willingness to cooperate, uh, a willingness to listen to each other, to set aside perhaps political differences, to work around substantive differences and find solutions. It was a leap of faith. This convention was adopted by consensus. The General Assembly adopted the convention unanimously. The real 
push uh, for the convention came actually from member states and in particular it came from developing countries. We are going into regions like Southeastern Europe, Latin America, Southeast Asia and really sitting down with both public and private sector actors. This is a convention designed to cover the world. And it covers the world because now you have 183 or soon 184 states parties. It's also been um, very successful in terms of the time that it took um, to reach that stage. Um, other conventions are around for many more years, um, decades, until they reach that level of, uh, of ratification. The speed at which the nations of the world joined the convention is all the more remarkable given its large scope and legally binding character. The UN acts as a mediator, as a facilitator to lead that dialogue between governments and civil society towards uh, transparency, accountability. If we have one thing which remains very strong is this collective political will. People are taking the convention seriously uh, and the obligation of then their obligations under it. And that the mechanism is in reinforcing that. It's all to lead uh, towards, towards building societies free from corruption and uh, their citizens that maintain zero tolerance for corruption. This convention covers a very a much broader range of offenses or crimes. Bribery of domestic public officials, bribery of foreign public officials, it also includes it. Embezzlement of public funds, uh, obstruction of justice, money laundering, uh, and then if you add to that also, this, let's say, the, the not-so-mandatory uh, provisions, you also have, for the first time, offenses about crimes or, or conduct which, is, which takes place entirely in the private sector, where the public sector has no, in, no uh, involvement. In order to comply with the convention, states' parties draft new laws on corruption, strengthen existing laws, improve their monitoring and enforcement efforts, and sometimes even design new institutions such as anti-corruption bodies. It also brings other innovative provisions in prevention. It also brings an entirely new chapter on asset recovery, which exists nowhere else. Very, very innovative and very forward-looking. But how far can these treaty provisions and the new domestic laws that implement them take us? You're advising a company as to how to behave and you do not know why there is a new legislation, or why new legislation is coming and how is this going to affect you, that's bad news. Through education, we have a chance of making more actively, more forcefully, the business case against corruption. In other words, why it is good for business not to bribe. You've mentioned how the United Nations, uh, the Office on Drugs and Crime, of course, works on laws. It works on institutions. It works on technical assistance. It, it does a lot of things that uh, in conjunction with states' parties, looks a little bit top-down. You get this new framework, this new legal architecture and so on that reorients how things work. But uh, I've heard from you that that's not enough and that it's also important to do some bottom-up type initiatives. So the moment was 2015 in Doha that this declaration was adopted. And a couple of years later, with the funding coming through, we were able to establish a program and under this program, we have this one initiative called Education for Justice. The acronym is E4J. And under E4J, we have primary level education, secondary level education, and tertiary level education components. And under each of those components, we're developing materials on each of the areas that UNODC works on. Organized crime, terrorism, cybercrime, firearms, human trafficking, migrant smuggling, corruption, and integrity and ethics. An academic's life is um, it's not very glamorous, <laughs> but it's an awful lot of work. There's a lot of information. Not only did I have to read a lot, but I had to reduce and condense a lot what I had to say to students, taking into account what they know, 
and being also able to give them the gist of what I wanted to achieve. UNODC did that, does this for us. Somebody has already done all of this beautiful work and packaged it, but not packaged it in a rigid way. UNODC did the research for us and condensed the information. And what is very interesting is that it is in a module system which allows me to pick and choose. So there's less work for, you know, sort of course design work for you to do, um, but you can still sort of make it your own. And it is a ready-made material which I don't have to follow blindly. We're trying to educate and to provide tools and to empower youth to think critically, to engage in society, to understand that they have a choice, and to have the tools to actually implement that choice. Because I think that's also very important. It's not just about understanding that you have the choice and maybe making the decision in your head, but it's also about how do you act it out? And how do you act it out when all the others are swimming the other way? And UNODC has now this program uh, on integrity, which is good. Because without having a management class that appreciates what is integrity and has these values and standards, you cannot get rid of corruption. In addition, the UN has also created programs around whistleblower protection, judicial integrity, and asset recovery, all intended to curb corruption. We must, as an international community, try to identify the weak links in the chain and strengthen them, providing help and support to countries that do not have the capacity, do not have the resources, and therefore they need the international community to rally around them and help them. The fact that we have 184 states parties is very significant because that means that those countries have decided freely to be bound by that instrument, which means to undertake certain obligations to make reforms, to make new laws, to change, sometimes they have changed constitutions, and they have agreed to be subjected to a peer review mechanism. There was one issue which was very contentious until the end, and that was whether the mechanism was going to have country visits. The UN Convention Against Corruption contains a review mechanism to help states' parties implement the treaty. The motive for this process is the states' parties themselves. With support from UNODC, they review each other's progress, engage in dialogue about challenges and best practices, reviewing each other's laws, and filing detailed reports complete with recommendations for future steps to take. In the end, country visits are left to the discretion of the country under review. When that solution was reached, uh, there were a number of countries that came to me and said, yeah, okay, we can live with that because we will never do a country visit. And I said to them, I will hazard a, a prediction. I said to them, all of you will actually ask for a country visit and you will come back and ask me yourselves to have a country visit and if you do that, then I will come and lead the country visit myself. We had a 100% fulfillment of that prediction. Country visits are an optional part of this review process, but in the first four years, 140 country visits took place. In a number of cases, that review process triggered uh, very significant domestic reforms, also in the area of anti-corruption. The fight against corruption led by the UN has taken on many forms, and while full of successes to date, still has a long road ahead. Professionalizing the fight against corruption that is, I think, the, the next big um, hurdle that we have to take. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And hopefully, if you're in this line of work, that motivates you to, to do more about it. And we need civil society, a free press, and young people to continue doing their valuable work in bringing to light corrupt practices and holding individuals, businesses, and governments to account. These other issues I care about, environmental protection or human rights, um, or even uh, industry and efficiency and economic freedoms, these other issues I care about are all dependent on a deeper issue, which is integrity. If you can connect up corruption with the other things that you care about, then I think the choice is pretty clear. If people are united in what matters most to them and they resist the temptation and manipulative efforts to be divided along some other line, 
then, then they can keep their power. Living in a society where corruption is the exception, where it, when it occurs strikes us as something inherently contrary to all of our collective beliefs, I think that is something that is absolutely achievable. You actually can make a difference, right? You can save the world. It's not just this pipe dream that you have as a college student when you're sitting at 3 a.m. with your friends, you know, talking about your hopes and dreams of the future. It's not, that's not the end of it. We're certainly not delivering a, an ideal world to the next generation. But it is, I believe, for the next generation to shift their approach and not accept this as a way of doing business or as a way of living and appreciate why it is important and to chart the way forward in a certain way which is different than what my generation did. The next generation of leaders um, to say, I want to understand the problem of corruption. I want to understand how it affects different aspects of society from top to bottom. Corruption is partly um, internalized, right? It's something, it's a way of doing things that's become normal and accepted. And people might not say it's good, but it's the way things are done. And so you conform by being part of it. But if you can take a step back and see other ways, question behaviors, you can decide who you want to be. If you are out there as a member of society, the best thing you can do is to be the person who does the right thing 